Recording in progress. That's really loud. All right, so we're in Philippians chapter, even though this, this, the overhead says Philippians chapter 2, we are in Philippians chapter 3. I need a proofreader now, don't I? Uh, so we're in Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to go ahead and read, um, uh, we're going to read verses 15. Let's see, we, we started off in verse, we left, last week we looked at verse 12 through 14, and I want to read, I want to start from 12, just because it, the context of verse 15 starts actually in the back. Um, let's read chapter 12. We'll read uh, maybe down through verse 16. We'll pick those up. We'll just pick them up in a couple of different chunks. So Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was also was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do Forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press onward on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are, as are perfect, have this attitude. And if anything, you have a different attitude. God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we've attained. Again, we'll read the rest of the uh, uh, the verses in a little bit, verses uh, 17 to 21. It's a little bit different section. And so as we've looked at the, sex, at the, at the section of Philippians in the last few weeks, uh, we've seen Paul more aggressively confront the enemies of the Philippians. And, and it, you know, when we begin in the very beginning uh, in, in Philippians chapter 1, there's no sense of animosity. Now, Paul is saying about the people who are preaching Christ but out of a bad motive. He doesn't really say that that's a... Um, he doesn't really call them enemies, though. In fact, he calls them something else because they're preaching Christ. This is a good thing. But as we look into the rest of Philippians, we get to chapters three and four, uh, we started to see Paul with a really aggressive posture towards the people who are the, he's calling the enemies of Christ. Uh, in verse two, he called them dogs, evil workers in false circumcision. So Paul's not mincing his words, if you will. He's not trying to hide behind something else. In fact, he's calling them out for what their attitude and their behavior is. They're not believers, and they're there with evil and, and, and vicious motives. Um, and this, of course, again, contrasts with the people we saw in, who are in Christ um, in chapter 1. Now, these people mean the church harm, and therefore they're the enemies of the church. These enemies are advocating some sort of perfectionism by becoming Jewish. Of course, Paul destroys those arguments, saying that in every way his Jewishness, uh, into which he was born and at which he excelled above all others, his Jewishness was better than their Jewishness, but that his Jewishness, frankly, was nothing but rubbish and garbage. Uh, it was to be left behind, remembered no more. Instead, he presses on towards one singular goal. He uses the metaphor of running and says that his goal is to run so that at the end, he hears the upward call where the presiding official um, of the Olympic Games calls out his name as the winner of the race. And that's what he's talking about in verse 14. I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call. At the end of the race, the presiding official would call, have the, the issue the call for the winner of the race to come forward so they could lay upon him a crown or a wreath. That, very much analogous to what we see in, in the rest of the New Testament as well. We want to be able to hear that, that phrase, well done, good and faithful servant, so that at the end of the race, Jesus, who presides over all that, is the one who's giving honor. But he has not completed the race yet, and that's where Paul is saying, we've got, still got work yet to do. Paul says, though, he says, Paul says to all who are mature, and, and mature, other versions translate that perfect. If you read in, in uh, verse 15, let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. Um, Paul's clearly bouncing off the idea he said back in verse 12, he says, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect. His, his idea in verse 12, he's issuing the idea of the enemies of Christ or the enemies of the cross are saying that if you become Jewish, you become perfect. <coughs> and Paul's saying that's not, that's not where we are. That's not how God works things. 
Um, but what he comes into in verse 15 now is the idea of maturing, not the idea of sinless perfection. Um, so he's, it's, a, it's a whole different concept. Um, Paul is bouncing off that idea in verse 12. Um, and not that he'd become perfect, he's referring to those who were the enemies, I'm sorry, he's referring to those who were not the enemies of the Philippians, but to those who were in agreement with him. Those that are behaving like Paul, thinking like Paul, loving like Paul. And how do we know that? Because of what comes next. He says, let us have this attitude. Now, I want to refer you um, in, the, uh, in the handout that I have given you, the one that I referred to last week, and I expect you to remember it from memory. Of course, I didn't give you a quiz, no, so I, and this will be an open book quiz now. Um, but there are, there are two sides of this, and one is just an expansion of the other. So the one that has just the heart on it has a little bit more detail. The one that has the heart and refers to God and self and others and circumstances is, uh, just gives you an idea. And, and that's one of the, the models we have in, in, uh, in counseling about how do we go about getting change in real life? How is it that God expects us to work um, with others? So we, we don't just say, go behave right as if that provides lasting change, but rather we, we, we attach the thinking, we, we address the ways that we, um, let, me, let me get it before I go off the topic too far. Right? The idea of, of cognitive thinking, you know, what do we think, what do we know, what do we believe? We have to address that, but we, we stop thinking one way and we start thinking a different way. Um, so let's just take, you know, the whole sin of, let's say, gossip, just to pick one that's fairly benign. We all know got what gossip is. You know, somehow we think that we can escape gossip because no one will know or few people know or few people will care. And somehow when we address gossip in the, in the church, we, we don't just say stop it, but we have to say, you know, this is sinful. This is sinful because you're destroying someone's reputation or, you know, you're hurting someone. You're acting, frankly, like their enemy because you're not out there for their benefit, you're out there for their harm. So that's when we address the cognitive aspects. But we not only stop thinking one way that it's okay, but we start thinking the way that God thinks, that gossip is destroying someone who's made in the image of God and destroying their reputation, destroying their, their uh, even their livelihood sometimes. So cognitive is a, is a matter of, we, we address the cognitive by putting off, by renewing the mind and putting on. Stop the old thing and start the new thing. But we also affect, we also change uh, what's called the affective, the desires, the, the valuing, the feeling, the emoting, the loving, you know, the things that we love to do. Um, somehow, <clears throat> a gossip can come about because we love to feel superior. We love to feel like, did you see the poor schmuck that did this? Boy, that's really horrible. That's really horrible of them. And somehow we feel better about ourselves. And again, so we, we, we want to put off doing that, but we want to start thinking again, someone being made in the image of God. And then finally, the volitional part is the aspect of willing or deciding, intending, committing or acting. You know, my behavior and the decisions I make based upon what I think and what I love, all that comes down to how do I behave? And if I just change, for instance, in, in counseling, if you just try to go for the change of stop that, stop the behavior, you haven't affected the cognitive, you haven't affected what someone thinks and you haven't affected what someone loves and the behavior won't go away. Whereas if you address all three with the scripture, putting off, renewing the mind and putting on, you do see lasting change. And so this becomes a really effective model. Now, the problem is our, if you turn it over, um, the, the, you see how the heart, the inner, and in, in the New Testament, in all of scripture actually, the heart is really what's called the inner man. It's the, it's the heart, mind, soul, strength. It's all the parts that are not our physical body that make us up. And again, we're made up of just two parts, body and soul. And the, and the soul is essentially this inner heart or inner man. But how we react to ourselves, how we react to others, how we react to circumstances, and how we react to God, we've got to take those into account. So this is, again, just a picture of what um, sometimes counseling is, is made a part of. It's kind of a bigger model. Um, but it gives you an idea that when Paul gets then to verse 15, uh, uh, and he says, let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude, he's doing exactly what this model starts to do, is starting to attack the thinking. That if we start to attract the thinking of stop thinking immaturely, start thinking about how things God thinks them and, and, and put, put off and put on um, by renewing the mind, he's saying we, we've got to have this attitude. 
Um, if you recall over the, the course of the, um, the idea of attitude, um, attitude is, is really the key word in Philippians, this idea of attitude. Now I'm gonna see if I can do this with uh, sharing the screen. And there's no, how are we doing back there? All right? Okay, so I'm going to walk through. I'm going to walk through all ten. Not, it's not ten verses, but all ten instances where this word uh, it has the same Greek word behind the scenes. Where we talk about attitude in verse fifteen, um, Paul says in in first uh, or in Philippians chapter one verse seven, for it's only right for me to feel this way about you. We, when we walk through Philippians, I mentioned that it wasn't a feeling of emotion. It was really a feeling of intent. It was a really feeling of how do I think about somebody. And Paul's saying, so it's only right of me to feel this way or have this attitude about you all because I've been, had you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in the defense of the confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. So that's Philippians 1, 7. So the idea of attitude, having the same attitude is what Paul's saying, I have this, this attitude about you all, right? So the next verse is Philippians 2, 2, make my joy complete being of the same mind. That is having the same attitude. Maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, um, having one purpose in mind or having one person in my attitude. Yeah, you sensing the theme here that Philippians is going on? I know we've been over it before, but I, I don't think I put it all on one page. And then finally he says, not finally, but in, in Philippians 2.5, have this attitude in yourselves, which also is in Christ Jesus. We want to, be, again, as a church, we want to have the same attitude, be on the same page, if you will, about what our values are, what our approaches are, and how we approach ministry. And if we don't, that causes disunity and chaos and, frankly, confusion. And God's not the author of confusion. We'll touch on that a little bit later. But we look to Jesus, who's the author and finisher of our faith. We look to him as how we have the same attitude. Have the same attitude is that Jesus put others above himself, and that's the, the Christ hymn that's in Philippians chapter 2. All right, so in a couple, this is the last page, but some more verses. Um, therefore, uh, all who are mature, let's have this attitude. And if anything, you have a different attitude, God will reveal it to you. So this is Numbers 5 and 6. You know, I, I forgot to explain. The numbers that are on there are, let me go back. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. So this is where instance 1 is, instance 2 is, instance 3. So, and you saw in, in, uh, in uh, Philippians 2, 2, the, the word appeared twice. And then we get to Philippians 2, 5, or 3.15, the word appears twice again, and that's our verse for today. Um, whose end is destruction, and we'll get to this one later on. Whose God is their appetite, whose glory is their shame, who have their minds on earthly things, that who have that same attitude, but not in a good way. These people have, are bent on something else, right? So this is the same idea. And I urge Yodia and, and I urge Sintiki to live in harmony in the Lord, that is, to have the same attitude about each other. They're clearly on separate pages about something. We'll, we'll get to that actually uh, next week. And then fi and finally, I can really say finally and mean it. Um, verses or instances nine and 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked an opportunity to act. So you appear to see the word twice appear. And the word concerned is our word for having the same attitude. Everybody clear what I mean about it's the same word that appears 10 times throughout Philippians. Now, Paul uses the word elsewhere, but this is the letter that you go, shortest number of verses, and yet the word appears 10 times. Every chapter, it appears. So it's, it's really the theme for which Philippians was written, you could say. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and uh, we'll come back to that then. And just so you don't get distracted, maybe I blank. We'll come back to it. All right, so, um, so, so to get back to our text, uh, Paul is addressing those who think differently on a point. When he says, let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. Um, he's, he's, Paul's really saying we have to be on the same page at this point. Uh, we might disagree on minor points, and Paul's saying that's okay. Paul's going to allow time to mature um, to get to the same point. Of course, we can be in agreement on the major points, um, but there are, there are two things to not take away from what I'm saying. 
I'm not saying that, you know, and I kind of skipped the, the, the beat here. Paul's saying we need to get on the same page. And Paul is, of course, directing the church, but he's saying that those of you who are mature, uh, we have the same attitude. But he's kind of implying that there are some in the church who don't have the same attitude. And Paul's really <clears throat> pulling them along. Now, there's two ways you can pull someone along. You can pull them along gently by putting your arm around their shoulder and bringing them along and helping them in the race. There are another way you can put a nose ring in their nose and pull them along that way, like you would an animal. Um, one will provide some more lasting change than the other. And so what Paul's trying to indicate here is that, you know, for lasting change, those of you who are not mature, not on the same, those of you who might be thinking you're mature, but are not on the same page, we need to give you some time to come along and be on the same page. He's not saying that once we're done, once we disagree, you're done. You're done here. Um, so I'm not saying that we're always lined up on every point of doctrine. Some are in different stages of growth and understanding. I'm also not saying that when we disagree, the church discipline is the next step, right? Because we all are in different stages and different uh, backgrounds and so on. We stand by individuals with whom we disagree. And though, a, and through a process of discipleship, not church discipline, but through a process of discipleship, help to see them grow. Uh, to quote a fellow named Walter Hansen, Paul does not demand total uniformity or, co or coerce absolute agreement on every point. So that's not, that's not what Paul's trying to do. But Paul, as a, the senior statement, statesman, really to the church of the Gentiles, he's really trying to bring them along. When they disagree, He's trying to give them some space to get to a spot where they do agree, because when they do agree, they will own it. They will be convinced. But if you if you yank them along, like putting a nose ring through their, their nose and try to yank them along in, in agreement, um, it will produce just bitterness and, and discord. Um, Paul is appealing to his audience, giving them some latitude to examine issues and some time to arrive at being of the same mind. To demand strict adherence to, at all times to every point of doctrine would be what the New Testament calls domineering. Uh, and First Peter talks about this. He says, First Peter chapter five verse three. I don't think I have a, a passage on the on the overhead. First uh, Peter five three. Nor yet as domineering over those assigned to your care, but by proving to be examples to the flock. So First Peter five three gives us the idea that even Peter and Paul are saying the same thing. You don't see maturity in people by coercing them to have the same opinion. You do that by discipleship and bringing them along in this most holy faith. And so it's a, there is a process and there is a time when you have to say enough's enough, but, but that's a very long, gracious uh, point in time. So uh, what, what would be the application of this when we look at, um, when he says in verse 15 and 16 again, um, just to read those. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have the same attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you also. Or God will also reveal that also to you. So again, Paul's expecting that the Spirit is the one who brings people along, not my special words, not my, my, my influence of my, my uh, uh, personality. God is the one who will reveal it. He says, verse 16, however, let us keep living by that same standard to which we've attained. That is, we need to be on the same page. I'm expecting God to come alongside you, reveal that to you, and we'll work together in light of that. But we'll also be, on, we'll also be in love with one another um, through them. All right, so, um, so what's the application of that? Um, in his book, Finding the Right Hills to Die On, uh, The Case for Theological Triage, Dane Ortland reminds us, there's an old saying, and I can't remember where I heard it, there is no doctrine a fundamentalist won't fight over, and no doctrine a liberal will fight over. The, doctrine, the, the liberals on the one hand and the fundamentalists on the other side. And so Orland in his book revisits uh, Dr. Al Mohler's article, A Call for Theological Triage and Christian Maturity, which is from uh, 2005. And we've talked about this before in class, but what I thought it would be good to do, because I think it's an application of the passage, that we, we take a look at it. Um, so let me let me get back to these. Um, yeah, I'm trying not to share the overhead because it, it, it does consume things, so. All right, so, so the, the theological triage would be, you know, there are first order doctrines. 
doctrines which we must have agreement on. We, you really can't be part of a church together if we're not in agreement with these things. Things like the Trinity, the full deity and humanity of Christ, what is justification by faith, or what is the authority of scripture. Now, I'm not saying you all have to study that or go to seminary to, to do that in order to be a member of the church, but rather we kind of know that Jesus is God, right? Amen and amen? Amen. Okay, good thing. Uh, and now I know you're there in the audience. <laughs> Zoom knows you're there as well. But you know, these are the doctrines that are central to Christian faith, and we, we hold them because we think scripture holds them, and they're inviolable. And really we can't have fellowship with each other, Christian to Christian, uh, if we don't believe in these same things, mm -hmm. right? So these are the first order doctrines. Um, and denial of these doctrines really starts you down the slippery slope of eventually denying Christianity itself. So these second level doctrines, um, now we get into things like the meaning and mode of baptism or complementarianism and egalitarianism. Um, second order doctrines are distinguished from the first order set by the fact that believing Christians may disagree on these. However, in that disagreement, it's very likely hard to have week to week fellowship with one another. Um, you know, second theological issues would be, you know, like I say, meaning of a mode of baptism, complementarianism, or egalitarianism, the nature of biblical counseling, um, cessationism or continuationism, that is, do, do the special sign gifts continue on to today, or did they stop at the end of the first century? As Christians, we can disagree on those things and yet still have some basic fellowship with each other. But it's very hard to be in a church together and conduct things without things being a matter of chaos and disorder. So it, it's again, it's a question of um, what brings order to a church and how it conducts itself, not a question of can we fellowship or not. So let me stop there because those that's probably the biggest distinction, first order and second order. I know we've been over this a little bit before, but does that, that make sense? Can you read that back, back there? Um, does that make sense? The first order being the essential things that we have to believe in. The, the, the second level order of things are things that we can conduct each other. We can be friends with each other, but it's going to be very difficult to be in churches with one another. I mean, we, we'll be, we, you can if you if some you can if you have two parties and someone believes one thing and the other believes a different. If one person stays quiet, but if you start to have disagreements, <laughs> you know it's going to result in chaos in your church. All right, and then there are, of course, third order things. Um, let me, for those of you who just came in, uh, we, in going through the first set of verses um, of 15 and 16, you now Paul says, therefore, let us as many as are perfect have this attitude. And if anything, you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you also. However, let us keep living by the same standard to which we've attained. There's a, there's a methodology where Paul's trying to say, we may not be on the same page on, on everything, but I'm expecting that you will mature. I'm expecting that God will reveal that to you. Now, what Paul's not saying is that if you disagree, you're out of the Philippian church. Ch church discipline starts today. Um, so, I, so he, Paul's not saying that, nor, nor am I. Um, and Paul's not saying that we have to be lined up perfectly on every last piece of doctrine, right? He's just saying, God is, you're in different spots and God's got to mature you in that. There's an aspect where God has to look at, you know, change your thinking, change the things you love, change your behavior in order for us to be on the same page. So the reason for looking at these things, I think this is then the application, this book from uh, from Dean Ortland and Al Mohler's article from uh, uh, from 2005. Um, so that's the first order and second order. Uh, first order, things, essential things we must believe. Uh, and that's just in order for people who call themselves Christians to be able to talk to one another. Second order things, we can believe different things and still have fellowship with one another, but probably not on a week by week basis. These are the these are the distinctives that um, that characterize why two different churches exist, right? These kinds of things. And then finally, uh, third level theological issues, things like we've talked about this before: eschatology, uh, which translation of the Bible, um, whether you wear head coverings or not, uh, is is. In, in Genesis chapter one and two, is that creation days or those literal days or those mean something else? Those are interpretive matters. And we can, have we can have disagreement on those things and still be in the same fellowship with one another and just disagree upon them and, and agree to hold each other in esteem, high esteem as well, right? Um, now, 
let me get to my notes here. Um, so the third order of doctrines are the doctrines which Christians may disagree and remain in close fellowship, even with local congregations. Um, what, what I appreciate that Orland did when he you know, wound up his book, he, said, he, might, he, he says, how do we go about evaluating these things? He says, there are four questions. One is how clear is the, is the Bible on this doctrine, any given doctrine? How do we go about establishing what's first order, second order, third order? How clear is the Bible? Is the Bible clear on the Trinity? Does the, does the Bible actually use the word Trinity? No. no, but we all know that scripture often refers to as the son as God and the spirit as God, and of course the father as God. And so you don't take very long to get to the idea that there, are, there is a God who has three persons, but you also have to be able to say there's the three persons and one God. Um, no, the, the Trinity is inherent in Scripture. Uh, it's just one of those doctrines, and it's the way you interpret them that leads you to that conclusion. And if we can't agree upon that, there's not any room for us to really to fellowship in the church. Uh, but if we say head coverings, um, when you say head coverings, when I say head coverings from, from 1 Corinthians 11, everybody read that passage before? Everybody, everybody firm or one thing I believe on head coverings? Because I don't see a single head covering. So, so I'm thinking you all got straight what you think. <laughs> um, and yet there are churches that hold to a different opinion on, on the, the nature of those. But can we still have fellowship if you don't wear a head covering? Absolutely, right? So, so you see there, there's, a, there's a spectrum of where we disagree. So how clear is the Bible on this doctrine? Um, we're still discovering, by the way, even as much as the last five years, um, ways that head coverings were important for secular pagan rituals in the first century. And this is why the, the uh, this, is, this is why it's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 11, is that, frankly, the Corinthians were behaving like the pagans in how they made offerings. Because the emperor or the, 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 per, the priest, the pagan priest, would take his toga or his robe and pull it up over his head, and that was his head covering. And that's why he's telling the men, don't behave like that. But we didn't discover this until the last five years. So it would be foolish to have a real firm opinion about something we have very little information, right? And that's why it's not really clear in the Bible what it's talking about because it's referring to a, he's referring to a cultural phenomenon. Now, having said that, even though he's referring to a cultural phenomenon, he's using creation arguments as for it. Why to behave this way? So now we have to go back to how do we interpret that? That's, again, outside of the scope of today, but you get the idea, I think. Um, how, how, how clear is the Bible and the doctrine? Um, what, is the, what is the doctrines important to the gospel? Well, so in the Trinity, where it becomes really important is what's called the doctrine of inseparable operations. God has how many wills? One. Wills. Well, God only has one will. Period. End of story. And God acts in accordance with that will. And if we say that God has more than one will, we, we're destroying the Trinity. Right? Because, it, again, just definition. So God has one will, and everybody acts in accordance with that, and everything that God does in accordance with his will, with his will of who's elect, how they're going to get saved, how they're going to bring through ultimate redemption of the body and of creation. So you begin to, you begin to destroy pieces of the, of the Trinity, and all sorts of scripture starts to fall apart. Right? And so God is the thing that holds it together. So it's important to the gospel that we understand the Trinity, because every aspect of the Trinity was involved in the, in the gospel. Right. So now, how much of the how much of the gospel is associated with the head covering? Not so much. <laughs> right. So you get you get the idea that's there. Uh, what's what is the testimony of the historical church concerning this doctrine? Well, first century believers, many women did wear head coverings, and for reasons that are really apparent to those who lived in the first century, um, it's a practice that died off after a period of time. Um, now. The testimony about the doctrine of the Trinity. Well, be, this became um, <laughs> this became this came to blows almost literally, and I, I say literally, meaning literally, as in as in writing. Um, how many of you are familiar with a, a guy named Saint Nicholas? <laughs> Everybody, uh, okay. No, uh, well, his name is Saint Nicholas. He was a, he was a, a bishop in the town of Myra um, in the in the three hundreds, so fourth century. Um, and he was a he was a um, contemporary of Gregory of, of Nazianzus, Gregory of Nyssa, um, the, the uh, Cappadocian guys is what you would call them, uh, Cappadocian fathers, uh, Athanasius. And there's a, a lore that 
um, St. Nicholas is the one who, uh, when, I um, can't remember his name all of a sudden. Arius? Yeah, when Arius was pr proposing his heresy, that uh, St. Nicholas punched him in the face. <laughs> Um, and that's that's still residing through lore, and that's been it's been going. There's no evidence of that whatsoever, but it's fun to think about. Um, and there's a uh, Santa Claus did that. Yes, <laughs> Santa Claus was a Santa Claus was a was a Nicene Trinitarian. You can you, you may quote me. So and and again that Saint Nicholas who gave gifts to, to children in his area, uh, a little town called Myra, or not a little town, but a town called Myra, M Y R A. That's where that whole thing comes from. So on, there's, there's your Christmas story for the week. Is all tying back to the Trinity. Uh, because Arius' heresy was, there was a time when, when he was not. It was, there was a time when, when Jesus was not born, when Jesus was not God. Yeah. Gina? Up at Nicaea, bishops pause, Arius and Santa Claus. One claims a time when the son was not. One says that's a heretical thought. Ho, 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 who's gonna go? Ho, 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 who's going to go? Off the full right hook, good St. Nick. Down goes the Jimmy Harrison. And I read that. And I read that. guy called the church curmudgeon. Yes, yes. Which I, I think I, I, I know I favorited that tweet uh, last week. Uh, that, <laughs> Uh, in a different venue, I might. Yeah. Uh, no. By the way, commercial church curmudgeon is one of the more hilarious uh, twi tweet tweet uh, Twitter contributors, especially when he goes to coffee. He and Matt Smith are some coffee. Anyway, I'm getting off track again. We're still. Um, so you you get the idea. You know, what's the historic? What's the testimony of the historical church uh, to that doctrine? And what's the doctrine's effect upon the church today? You know, head coverings don't really help or hurt the church today. Now, again, some denominations have said that's a distinctive. We want to follow the scripture and all it says. I can appreciate the sentiment. And if you're going to join a church that's there, you're going to be expected to behave like the church that's there. Um, and so they, they would, those people would actually probably move the, that thing up to a, a second order uh, criteria. But really, I think it's third because over, over this course of decades and millennia, we've actually had not head covering people um, fellowshipping with head covering people. All right, so let me stop there because that's a lot of me talking fast. And uh, this, do you see the example though? In 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 Philippians, he's trying to say those of you who are mature, we have to, need to have the same attitude in verse fifteen. Um, and if anyone if anyone has a different opinion, which Paul's sort of implying, anyone who's less mature, we're going to give you some space to come along because God is the one who reveals those things. It's not a matter of you lining up perfectly on every doctrine, but you know if. If you're going to be considered mature, then you're going to have to you're going to have to come to the position where you understand this. So that's that's the kind of the explanation of that verse. And again, Ortland's book I think just does it's not a large book, but Ortland's book does a good job of bringing that argument up to up to speed. Any questions? Are you talking gentlemanly? No, it's a book by it's by Dane. Let me get back to my notes. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, Finding the Right Hills to Die On, oh. The Case for Theological Triage by, by Dane. Isn't, didn't he, he's not the one I did, John? He is. Oh, he is. Yeah, yeah. And deeper. Right now, I'm, I'm really tickled with Dane's writings the last couple of years. Not that I wasn't tickled with him before, just they've come to the forefront in my purview. So he's, he's a good writer. All right, so, uh, so that kind of brings us then to verse 17. Uh, with, what's that? All right, verse 17, brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Now, I don't have a whole lot of comments, frankly, about this, this passage, but one thing that strikes me is, you know, this is one of the reasons that, that it's so essential uh, that those of you who are members recognize and nominate individuals for elder who are apt to teach. Um, individuals who are capable of examining scripture, of interpreting it correctly, of being familiar with the historical theology, um, and of, of assessing the implications of an application for the church today. We can't have people bringing um, the world order of interpretation and prioritization into the church. In other words, we can't bring the world and its viewpoints into the church as if that's how we conduct things. Mm -hmm. 
you've got to have what does scripture say and how does scripture tell us what to do how does it inform us because if and we'll quote this again later but first peter you know one three we have everything we need for life and godliness now that doesn't mean we have everything we need for math it doesn't mean we have everything we need for science you know, rockets rockets travel but we have everything we need for life and godliness um so that's and that's out of the providence of god he's spoken to us through his word and his his uh, and his spirit gives us illumination so one final thing on this passage you know uh, we want to stand by individuals with whom we disagree on issues and we want to be full of grace when we disagree about minor points allowing for time uh, to be of the same mind when however when the disagreement arises to where people are taking sides uh, and there's disunity and chaos and confusion then we're seeing a repeat of the pattern that's in the philippians where they're not uh, along with each other um, and so it becomes a, then it does become a matter of church discipline all right so let's get to uh the next section and uh let me go to let's go to there um so verse 18 and 19. Uh, for many walk of whom i often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of christ whose end is destruction whose god is their appetite and whose glory is their shame who set their minds on earthly things and there's that phrase set their minds on that's our verse or that's our word occurring 10 times throughout philippians of having the same attitude now here he's using it in a you know what's called a pejorative fashion he's using it as a slam against their attitude he doesn't like their attitude their attitude's sinful even they're of the same attitude which might seem, seem like that'd be a good thing but they're of the same attitude and he calls them what in verse 6 or 17 or 18 he calls them enemies all right, so leveraging the appeal to follow his pattern. Yeah, so uh, Philippians 3.18 is where we're, we're back to now. Uh, Philipp, um, Paul now even gets more pastoral for his flock. He sees dangers, his words convey urgency, and he's pointed at those who pe his, his, those people are. They're the enemies of the cross of Christ. The Philippians are called on to follow Christ or Paul's example, and these people will not. I sense some confusion. All right? Oh, no. Never mind. Never That's mind. my normal walk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So Philippians 3, 18 and 19. So um, the, Paul's really trying to argue, and here he's getting pointed in Ozzy as in all of chapter 3, is that there is a group of people who are enemies of the church. And they've tried to come from with outside and tell you what it means to be righteous. If you're just Jewish enough, you'll be considered righteous. And Paul's trying to say, no, that's not the way we do things. From my righteousness, I'm as Jewish as the next guy. I'm more Jewish than you can possibly imagine. And to me, that's all rubbish behind the scenes. And so Paul's continuing on in this rest of the chapter to, to attack their attitudes and saying, this is no way to have an attitude for each other, right? These aren't people with whom we have minor disagreements. These are people with whom we have major first order disagreements and they're in, in, endangering the flock. These are discipleship uh, opportunities. These are people who look to pull the Philippians back into bondage to the law, just as we would see if we were looking at Galatians. These people are enemies. Now, an enemy is, is one who acts for your harm. Now, I actually have a definition here. One who acts for your harm and for um, one who acts for your harm and benefit to himself. Acts for your harm and his benefit. One can be a friend whose actions end up being a harm to you. In other words, even though you may, you may know someone and they, you might be friendly with them, when they start to do something for your harm, intentional or even unintentional, they start to become your enemy, right? And so what, what we want to do is be able to compare that. I did a nice little chart just to be able to compare it. An enemy is one who acts for selfish benefit at a cost to others. A lover or a friend would be one who acts for others' benefit at a cost to self. You see the, the you see the difference in the separation, and what Paul's saying is these people who are coming in, giving you an idea of bondage, are acting for their own benefit. They're not acting for your benefit; they're acting for their own benefit, for their own cause, for their own purpose, and they're so they're and that comes at a cost to self because now the Philippians, if they were to follow, put themselves in bondage. They put themselves under the rope and the yoke of having to live for the law again. The actions of an enemy are clearly hostile. Again, someone can be so many your friend, but they do something that 
uh, is disruptive to you or is, is we use the, the idea of gossip before, someone who, who is, calls himself your friend but gossips about you is acting as your what? Enemy. Enemy. So it's not to be treated as a nice, kindly, light thing. Martha? I found that uh, people who embrace a liberal theology, they don't like Paul because he's constantly drawing those lines in the sand. Sure. You, know, you, you can't. You know, when if you're liberal, you can go back and forth and fudge a little bit. You know, but they don't. I I ran and I said they don't read that because it's not. Um, it's not exciting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. It's not exciting. Yeah. Well, because it's convicting. I mean, it's, it's, it's not exciting. Right. Right. So the the actions of an enemy are. Thank you, Martha. The, the actions of enemies are hostile. Yeah, and, and we saw this earlier on when Paul said, you know, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And, and he says, you know, for, and his first two examples were stop arguing and stop questioning authority. Or he said, stop grumbling and stop complaining. Um, and so we, we took a look at those, you know, some weeks ago. We saw in Philippians uh, chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. Um, the idea of arguing is, you know, when you're, when you're uh, the idea of complaining is the, was the first one. Um, the idea of questioning authority was the second one. Making minor points to be major points is really the idea. And I heard someone say that a fundamentalist is someone who takes all three of those categories of first order, second order, third order, and makes them all first order. So if we disagree on any point, I'm going to dis I'm going to shun you and disown you. And, and some churches are run like that as well. But we have to be wise, and this is what Paul's point is in this passage. We have to be wise about where that boundary is. We have to be wise with those who disagree with us as well. That just because they disagree with us doesn't mean we're kicking them out of the fellowship. We're, we're rather, we're allowing time for the spirit and the word to, to have their impact. Titus chapter one verses, or Titus chapter, sorry, Titus chapter three verses nine to 11 says, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law for they're useless and worthless. We reject a divisive person or a divisive person, depending on part of the country you're from. Uh, we reject a divisive person after a first and second warning, knowing that such a person is deviated from what is right and sinning, being self-condemned. Meaning that you know, we give people some space. But if they're causing confusion, causing discord, then we warn them and warn them and have some grace about how we do that. It's like there's no timetable that says in the period of one week, they got to have their mind changed. There's just at some point in time they do have we do have to see progression to change the attitude of being on the same page and if we don't see it then it's time to to remove them and so Paul makes it it's simple for the Philippians to understand their end is destruction in verse 19 and yet these people think that they've arrived at the goal already verse 19 is one of those passages that's really difficult to get a handle on it, you know he says who, uh, whose God is their appetite whose glory is their shame and who have their minds on earthly things. Who, whose God is their appetites very much sounds like from Romans chapter 16, um, verses 17 and 18. Now I urge you brothers, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you've learned. And turn away from them for such people are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. So Romans was written, you know, some years before. Romans was actually written from Corinth after Paul's letter to the Second Corinthians. So this is some time ago. This is about five years before Paul's writing it, but he's still running now into the same problem. People following their own appetites is people looking after their own interests, trying to make up their own rules, trying to make their own uh, idea of what God wants. And, and so it seems that Paul is talking about people who cause divisions in a church in this section. Um, as we've already spoken, this isn't referring to just minor disagreements, but over questions of the first order doctrines. Or consider what Paul says. He says, their end is destruction. If someone isn't baptized in a specific manner, does that mean they're not going to heaven? No. It's, you have to be born again. You have to be born again. But being baptized and how you're baptized, that's a whole different question, right? Um, does that result in their eternal loss? No. If someone doesn't agree with you on wearing head coverings in public, is their guilt now so insurmountable that they're doomed to hell? <laughs> I hope that. <laughs> now, it, it, this would seem to be first order directives because their end is destruction, is what he's saying. Their glory is their shame? It's still difficult, but it seems that people were proud about, frankly, what they should have been ashamed of. And, and so he's taking them to task for that. And both of the clauses are then summarized by they have their minds on 
earthly things. All they want is what is in this life, and they have no view of the next. So let's round out uh, in our time remaining uh, in these last two verses. For our citizenship is in heaven. So Philippians 3.20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Now the connector four is the important part here uh, because it ties it back to the, the previous idea. And it gives us some light on the phrases in verse 19 about those who have their mind on earthly things. Early on in the book of Philippians, we touched on the idea of citizenship. Um, the Philippians were citizens of Rome and when you were citizens of Rome, uh, Ro Philippi would be considered a colony of Rome, and the roles of who was a citizen would actually be contained not in Philippi, but in Rome. Your, your, your identity, your rights and privileges would actually be kept on record in the main place, in, the Rome, in Rome, where your, your citizenship was actually kept. So it was like a global citizenship. You weren't, you weren't so much citizens of Philippi, you were citizens of Rome who had a colony in Philippi. That makes sense? Yes. Right. And in, in the very same way, we have our citizenship in heaven. Right? Our citizenship isn't in, in Grace Fellowship Church, and by extension then included, our citizenship is in heaven, and there's a colony in Grace Fellowship Church. Right? And so this was the relationship between Philippi and, and citizenship was, was not conferred on everyone. Um, they were aware of the special privilege of peace and the promise of prosperity and the risks associated with causing disruption in Philippi. To, to upset the city was to upset Rome, the metropolis or the mother city. Uh, but the Philippi, Philippians would be looking to Christ to walk with them in their suffering. And in so doing, they became like Christ. And so that's what Paul's trying to comfort them here. One, we're going to be on the same mind. We're going to be unified. We're going to be together. We're going to be on the same purpose. We're going to be encouraging, strengthening, challenging one another to walk in his most holy faith. And in so doing, we take on these sufferings together. This is not just a, you take on the sufferings, good luck, but rather we take on the sufferings together. Um, the suffering causes them to look to the heavenlies where their citizenship lies, to Jesus on the throne in the heavenlies, interceding and advocating for his brothers and sisters. It will cause them to look forward to end times when Jesus returns to remove all sorrow, when he delivers up us new bodies in the place of those that are decaying. And Paul calls the Philippians to look back at the end of the entire plan of redemption. I'm sorry, yeah, calls, he calls them to look at the end of the entire plan of redemption and find hope there. So Paul's really is grounding people into when we endure suffering, even if it's people in our midst who are causing issues, or when, when we're enduring suffering because of those who are without, let's say the, the government or the state or our neighbors or even our loved ones, that we collectively gather together and we can encourage and strengthen one another in this, in this church. He's causing us to, to want to then look to Christ who, has, who both began this plan of redemption and who finishes the plan of redemption. And we see that conclusion when we receive our bodies and we receive the new heaven and the new earth. And we see that in Romans chapter 8. So it's critical that we understand, as we kind of wind up the passage, it's critical we understand the nature of disagreement. On the one hand, about those with whom we disagree, we, we need to extend grace um, to grow, a space to become convinced, not by our persuasive words or our personality, but by the spirit and by the word. On the other hand, we cannot tolerate disagreement about the essentials. God has no place for chaos and disorder and disunity in the body of Christ. Now, 1 Corinthians 14.33 says, For God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. And remember the context of 12, 13, and 14 Corinthians is how you use the gifts, not for my own purpose, but for the purpose of building up the body. So regardless of what your church polity is, whether it's congregational or elder-led, God establishes church leaders. And even in the midst of difficulties and trials, even when there are enemies, we find our hope in the heavenlies where our citizenship exists, and then hope in the church that is put here as a colony of Christ. All right, so as we wind up, just a couple notes about the days are ahead, because we we made it through a massive amount of verses considering what's happened the last month or so. Um, we, we made it through, what, what, six or seven, seven verses today. We'll finish up chapter four in probably three weeks or so. It's not, not a long series of pieces, but in some sense, 
chapter four is the culmination of where Paul's been headed. And when he starts out chapter four is the culmination, I think, of the whole book. Um, so when we, what are we gonna do next, he says. So starting in late January, probably the, the third or fourth week of January, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna go through a book called Caring for One Another. Um, it's a series of eight, book, eight, eight studies. Um, I think I got it for the magical price of $6. Whoa. <laughs> yes, study. Um, uh, well, I don't think I did. I know I did it. Uh, so we're going to go through that. It's a guy named Ed Welch who's on the, um, he's a biblical counselor on the staff at uh, Christian Counseling and Education Foundation out in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, so we're going to walk through that and um, and we'll have I'll have books for that, and that's available if you don't if you want an ebook. There's ebooks that are available. Um, I'll just have the paperback books, and I should have those probably in two weeks or so. So that's what's up next. Um, and what I thought would you know if I we could do a whole study on the one another's, but do you remember how many one another's I said there were? Thirty one. I think thirty one is the number that I counted. Um, I don't really want to engage in a thirty one week study right now in my life. <laughs> Uh, some other day, maybe. Uh, well, that'll cover. Caring for one another will cover se cover several, and it kind of gives you the basic idea of what's out there. And I'll, I'll also have lists of what those thirty one are, so we'll be able to go through those. So, all right. So as we wind up this morning, uh, any questions, criticisms, complaints, observations, existential crisis? Yeah. Well, I tend to sometimes speak out. <laughs> sometimes, but I'm learning because my on the cruise with my sister, she came to me and she said, did you know that the Ten Commandments were written on sapphire? I was like, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I've read through about, about 10 times. I said, but, I said, what? I find that every time I read through, I learn something new. <laughs> and so she showed me and still didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> it talked about the, uh, that on the throne and the the the, uh, the floor being paved with sapphire. Yeah. And she just felt like since that was Moses was there, that he told Moses to cut him out of sapphire. Ah. And I just so I said I said you can't do that. It doesn't say that. But I said it's not a holy diamond. We can still have fellowship with one another, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. She was she was the bear. It's like no. Well, I said we're not. Like, it's not worth arguing over. I said you know. It doesn't affect doctrine. <laughs> so. Very good. Doesn't it? Doesn't affect our eternal salvation. Right. So, yeah. Ben, you had something. Uh, we were talking about saying that we were reminded of something that we did for the homeschool Bible study. One time we were learning about the church, and we actually were learning something about him. Something that it said was that that um, that what was it? We're pretty sure that that boxing wasn't around back then. But one of the things that it said was. You better be good because if you're very nice, then you'll end up on the floor. The boxing gloves going straight from the street. Take that list as a boxer. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I have a, uh, I'll send everybody the, a cop copy of the gift. Uh, it's a little, little tiny uh, graphical image. I'll send it everybody <laughs> of uh, St. Saint, Saint Peter take, or St. Saint, uh, Saint Nicholas taken out. Uh, areas. So, areas. That's just funny to me. All right. So anyway, that's that's where the that's where the lore comes from. So there really was a Saint Nicholas um, who was known for his gifts to good uh, gifts to children, um, and but the fact that he took out Arius in a, in a in a fight was probably not true. All right. So let's let's close in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for again this this season as we remember uh, the birth of our Lord Jesus. Even as we've looked at today, we still see him sitting on the throne, interceding and advocating for us. And even in the midst of difficulties, when we have issues, Father, we know that he's interceding for the unity of the church, uh, that we might be mature and we might get along uh, all for your glory. So keep us both aware of the dangers that are out there, but looking forward to the opportunities of being with one another and maturing one another and, and, and advocating for one another. So we ask your blessing upon the day as we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good luck.